In this video, I want to talk about supplementing niacin, so vitamin B3 for depression. We will discuss how to do it correctly, who most benefits from it, and what side effects you can expect. As you will see, there's a lot of contradictory information about niacin online, so we will also debunk a few myths along the way. Of course, before I get started, one important disclaimer, none of this is medical advice. It's for educational purposes only. If you suffer from depression, please talk to a professional and have everything cleared by your doctor. With that out of the way, what is niacin and how can it help with depression and mental illness? Niacin, also known as vitamin B3, is a water-soluble B vitamin. Foods high in it include meats, especially organ meats like liver, and also fish, avocados, and brown rice. Like most other B vitamins, it's important for energy production, so it helps your body produce energy from the nutrients that you take in. On top of that, it helps regulate cholesterol and other fats, and also repair DNA. Interestingly, niacin can be made by your body to some degree. It does this by converting the amino acid tryptophan. So technically, it should not be called an essential vitamin. But that's just some general info on it. What we're interested in in this video is the relationship between niacin and mental health. Online, you will find many reports of people greatly benefiting from niacin supplements. But there's also quite a few reports of side effects and symptoms worsening. So what's going on here? How can we make sense of all this contradictory information? What you need to know is that the research on niacin and supplementing it for mental health goes all the way back to the 1950s. To quote the book Nutrient Power, which by the way is amazing, in 1951, Canadian psychiatrist Abram Hoffer and his colleague Humphrey Osmond began experimenting with high doses of niacin and reported major reductions in auditory hallucinations and schizophrenia symptoms. They conducted six double-blind, placebo-controlled experiments that yielded impressive evidence of improvement in the niacin group. Best results were reported for young schizophrenics with lesser efficacy for chronic patients. After many years of research, Hoffer recommended a protocol involving the combined use of niacin, folic acid, vitamin B12, vitamin C, essential oils, and special diets for schizophrenic patients. Since then, there were a few other researchers that also looked at niacin and how it could help with mental problems. But interestingly, the supplement seemed to become less helpful over the years. In a more recent study, a moderate niacin intake was associated with lower odds of depression, but very low or very high intakes seemed to increase depression risks again. So the researchers basically found a U-shaped relationship. Again, how is this possible? How can we have so much conflicting research on one vitamin? And how can we figure out what exactly niacin does to your mental health and brain? To understand what's going on, we need to look at how niacin affects your neurotransmitters. The standard explanation for niacin's benefits is the following. If the body is deficient in niacin, it will use the amino acid tryptophan to produce it. I talked about this in the beginning of the video. The problem is that tryptophan is also a necessary amino acid for serotonin production. So if your body needs tryptophan to produce niacin, it will have less for serotonin production. By the way, it takes around 60 milligrams of tryptophan to produce one milligram of niacin. So the basic idea is that a niacin deficiency will use up tryptophan, which then leads to low serotonin. And once you fix the niacin deficiency, more tryptophan can again be shuttled towards serotonin production. Other potential benefits that are sometimes listed include niacin's antioxidative properties and it being a precursor of NAD, which helps with energy production. These things would definitely explain the correlation between low niacin levels and depression that I showed earlier, but it doesn't really explain why very high niacin intakes are also correlated with depression, and it also doesn't explain why the supplement seemed to become less helpful in studies over the years. To understand that, you need to understand niacin's secondary effects in terms of methylation and dopamine regulation. Like I said before, much of the initial research on high-dose niacin was done in the 50s and 60s, 
where most mental illness patients were overmethylators. I explain overmethylation in more detail in a different video. It basically leads to very high levels of the main neurotransmitters, dopamine, adrenaline, and also possibly serotonin. Niacin is a very potent methyl reducer since its processing in the body uses up methyl groups. On top of that, it also promotes histone acetylation, which is a fancy way of saying it activates neurotransmitter reuptake genes. Reuptake means neurotransmitters are more quickly reabsorbed, meaning their function is reduced. This effect usually takes a few weeks to kick in and is extremely beneficial for someone with high neurotransmitter levels, but harmful to someone with low neurotransmitter levels. So if an overmethylator takes niacin or its derivative niacinamide, they will benefit. But if an undermethylator who already has low neurotransmitter levels takes it, they will likely crash and get worse. To quote nutrient power again, niacinamide inhibits sirtuins, a class of proteins that effectively remove acetyl groups from histones and promote methylation. By this mechanism, increased intake of vitamin B3, niacin or niacinamide results in higher gene expression of transporters and reduced dopamine activity. This is especially useful for paranoid schizophrenics who have excessive dopamine activity. So if you have high dopamine levels, like many patients likely had in the early niacin studies, you will benefit from niacin. But nowadays, most mental illness patients are actually under methylators, at least if we trust the data from the Walsh Research Institute. Why this switch from majority overmethylation to majority undermethylation occurred is difficult to say. Could be changes in environment, in the diet, or even the increased folic acid fortification and supplementation, especially in pregnant women. Either way, the result is that if you give high-dose niacin to a random person with mental illness today and without knowing their methylation and neurotransmitter levels, chances are higher that their symptoms would get worse instead of better. Now, what does all that mean in practice and what are the key takeaways here? Basically, two things. One, avoiding a niacin deficiency can be helpful in maintaining healthy serotonin levels. And this should be done mainly through a healthy diet and optionally low-dose niacin supplements. On the other hand, high-dose niacin or niacinamide supplements really only benefit one particular group of people, at least when it comes to mental health aspects. And this group of people is overmethylators, especially if they have excessive dopamine levels. Dosage is always individual, of course, but for these people, doses of several hundred or sometimes even more than a thousand milligrams aren't uncommon. Like I said before, these high doses are generally not recommended for people with low dopamine levels, which are most often found in undermethylators. If you're interested in testing and my recommended practitioners, please check out my program for more infos. I hope you like this video and I see you in the next one.